Hello guys and welcome to Astrology 1. So, uh, in order to study Astrology, in my opinion, I think there, there are two ways to do it. Uh, first is John Quera, studying John Quera's book of basic Astrology. This book is thorough, is detailed, and combines the perfect proportion and balance of information that is with details, but also not too much information so as you lose the whole point of the focus. I think it's a book that actually informs a medical or dental student and of the basic concepts and perfectly introduces him to this world of uh, medicine. After you've studied the chapter, whatever chapter you study, let's say for example epithelial tissue from John Quera, then you should proceed and go on to thehistologyguide.com. Uh, this website is one of the uh, greatest tools for histology students because you can actually visualize all the structures. It's practically your own personal microscope at home. With the additional help that it contains super links and a description on the side, and actually you'll see how this works in a bit. And uh, so on the side, you're going to find this description with super links. So once you click on a super link, this, the website is going to zoom in you, is going to zoom for you uh, and show you the structure or cell or whatever the, the super link that uh, you chose. And it's one of the perfect tools to understand histology. So first theory from John Quarry to understand how the structure looks like, how the structure looks like, how it functions and uh, pretty much the whole concept of it. And then histology guide to really understand and to visualize the structures you've just studied about. So before, let's before, let's before we start talking about the topic at hand today, which is going to be tissue slide preparation, let's take a talk a bit about the uh, point of histology and the philosophy of histology. Well, of course, histology uh, is also follows the the, the the scientific evidence of uh, of the order of specific order. So first we have the cell, which is the smallest living unit. And many cells together will form and will function together and work together to form a tissue. So in other words, a tissue is nothing more than just many cells of different types and different categories working together to form a more organized structure. Many different tissues are going to become work together to become an organ, which again, as a comparison, in, in the same rationale will follow the system and many systems will form the human body. So generally speaking, there are four tissues in the human body. We'll discuss them thoroughly through our whole videos and then next videos. So, uh, let's talk a bit about what the word histology means. Histo comes from the Greek word tissue, so, and logy is study of. So this is practically the study of tissues. And uh, tissues are composed of two different uh, components, let's say, cells and extracellular matrix. So the cells, of course, typically produce many other products, many cellular products, many uh, liquids, fluids, uh, substances, chemicals, a very, very vast uh, range of molecules. And all of these molecules are going to actually come together and form the extracellular matrix. Of course, there are different proportions of cells to the extracellular matrix and different tissues, but we'll discuss them in the videos, uh, in the next videos. So, how do you make, how do you study tissues? Well, of course, first of all, you need a tissue, you need a sample. So, how do you get the sample? There are two ways to get the sample. The first step, actually, in the slide operation is to take a sample. So there are two options, living samples and dead samples. So dead samples, or uh, this process of taking a sample from a dead organism is called necropsy or autopsy. And from living is biopsy. So uh, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with some of these methods. You already heard them from general knowledge. You've heard about, for example, endoscopic excision and endoscopic uh, processes. Uh, for example, gastroscopies or colonoscopies. These are methods that we can actually obtain a small sample from the in gastroscopy, for example, from the stomach or the esophagus, and uh, obtain, it, obtain a small sample, and then further on analyze it using the microscope. Of course, there's the needle biopsy. This is typically done for small tissues, and uh, actually, this is small volumes. Let's say small volumes of uh, tiny, tiny volumes of uh, tissues. Uh, then we have excision. Excision practically means to cut out a part of the human body, take it out, and then analyze the microscope. And lastly, there's the curettage. For example, one very famous and popular method of uh, curettage is the PAP test. Of course, the PAP test is scraping the cervical wall and obtaining a cellular, uh, let's say, cellular sample, which further on will analyze uh, in the microscope. So uh, let's move on. Let's understand. First of all. We have to take a tissue, okay? Uh, that's the first step. But let's take, for example, that we take a part of the skin. Okay, we want to visualize part of the skin in the microscope. Uh, after you've taken the samples, most of the human body actually is filled with bacteria, filled with other sources, filled with, uh, let's say, uh, um, foreign molecules and foreign substances. So 
the first thing we should do is to practically stop bacteria from destroying and practically uh, metabolizing the tissue because of course there's going to be no uh, immune reaction it's practically outside of the body so there is no potential for it to maintain itself so uh, we have one potential threat to the tissue which, is, which are the bacteria number one second of all the cells themselves tend to destroy themselves how is that because the moment you lose the potential to produce ATP the moment you lose the potential to produce energy your inner your the inner cellular components will start to collapse and most importantly the molecules that will actually collapse and cause the destruction of the cell are the lysosomes because the lysosomes are filled with catalytic enzymes that once released and opened up within the cytoplasm the cytoplasm then we're gonna this is gonna practically re, uh, result into the lysis of the cell autolysis in fact auto comes from cell and lysis is from the word to destroy so generally there are two i'm sure you've heard of the term lysis but typically lysis is uh practically caused by either some external source or osmotic pressure or any other uh, any other let's say uh, external factors in autolysis practically the cell itself is responsible for the destruction of its own cell so we need to practically stop these two processes from happening because if we take part of the skin out and we let it like this of course the bacteria eventually we're going to destroy and uh, practically eat up literally eat up and digest the whole structure as it is and the cells are going to collapse so we won't be able to see anything in the microscope in order to stop this from happening we use fixation we use fixatives fixatives are chemicals that practically stop these two processes from happening and of course one of the most famous uh, fixative is alcohol of course formalin which is again uh, again a sort of let's say uh, solution of alcohol there's glutaldehyde osmium tetroxide and other types of mixtures there are the simple and the mixtures simple are just one practical one effective molecule inside for example in formalin the alcohol itself and the mixtures typical mixtures are all buoyance fluid and zenkers both of these are based on formalin which in fact is based on alcohol so practically one of the most uh, let's say uh, widespread and wide view, widely used uh, fixatives is alcohol of course uh, in order to choose a fixative in order to uh, make this this decision on what molecule we have thousands of chemicals so what chemicals should we use to actually uh, achieve this purpose so we need to have some criteria themselves all right first off we need to be able to penetrate the whole tissue meaning what meaning that i cannot have a chemical that actually only attaches only penetrates the top only penetrates just the bottom we need a chemical that is small enough or let's say uh, has the potential to practically infuse itself throughout the whole thickness of the slide throughout the whole thickness of the tissue so this is the first criterion that we have to we have to penetrate the whole tissue easily second of all it has to maintain structural integrity what does it mean it means simply that i cannot have a chemical that is caustic or destructive enough that actually destroys itself it, the, the the whole structure itself so i need the chemical to be toxic for bacteria to stop of course uh, the lysosomes from from disintegrating but of course i needed to maintain i needed to be able to maintain the structure of the cells so i can actually later visualize them in the microscope and lastly this is to allow staining the third criterion this is a criterion we'll discuss later on after we discuss the whole process we'll come back to this to truly understand why we need to allow staining so at this point we simply have taken part of the skin out we've applied a fixative so this tissue this tissue is going to stay itself like this there's not going to be bacteria anymore so the tissue is not, not going to be to dissolve itself so what's the next step the next step is to practically uh, start to put it in a box so we can cut it in very very thin slices of course because the skin is actually or any structure in the human body is too thick to be visualized in the microscope so the logic is this so we have to cut them in very very thin slices so we can actually use a light microscope to see through the slide if a slide is very very thick more exceeding some specific micrometers we'll discuss how thick it's going to be but if it's thick then light will not be able to pass through it so we won't be able to visualize anything through it so the the, the problem is this okay we've taken the skin again it's clear but you cannot cut this piece in tiny tiny literally in micrometers because it's going to fall apart so I need something to practically hold the integrity of the tissue and to practically embed it into some, let's say, uh, area, some specific molecule. Take this example for it. Take a small example. If you have a piece of bread, okay, a piece of slice of bread, 
and you have to cut this this bread in tiny tiny molecules in tiny in five micrometers thick no matter how good a knife you have no matter how good tools you have you will not be able to hold it from from tearing it apart so the logic is this we're going to put it in a, we're going to embed it into this molecule called paraffin so the next step is going to be called embedding the logic is this to cover up the whole tissue in something that is uh, let's say practically uh, it's paraffin if you have to, you have to actually see the picture of paraffin to understand what it is so it's uh, a molecule that allows the whole tissue to practically be uh, and surrounded with this molecule so what's the steps for okay so again we had the skin which is different which is uh, fixated so first of all we need to remove the water from the content of the from the whole tissue itself this is going to be the first step of embedding which is dehydration this is typically done with alcohol or sometimes acetone but typically alcohol so we take this skin and we put it through many different let's say uh, sol solutions with increasing percentage of alcohol reaching eventually 100% of pure alcohol so there is no water in place and just only uh, only the alcohol is taking the place of the water itself the next step is going to be clearing what is clearing clearing is the embedding of xylene and the, the placement of xylene inside this tissue okay why is this because xylene is a molecule that practically will take the place of alcohol eventually and uh, the good thing with xylene is that it can evaporate easily so the spaces that were originally filled with water now will be, now will be uh, placed with alcohol and next step is going to be practically replaced with xylene so xylene is the, again the, for the property of xylene is that it can evaporate easily so these spaces that were in the beginning original water will eventually become empty spaces which is exactly what we wanted so after after the clearing stage where again actually is placed in the inside the slide we're going to have the placement of the uh, slide in the oven so the xylene evaporates and then we're going to have the paraffin infiltration we're going to practically place paraffin and make this block of tissue itself okay so in this case in this stage we have the skin clear cleared taken out from this the, the human body fixed fixated so there is no dis no destruction of the cell structure and lastly it's put in a block of paraffin the next step is this now we have to section it we have to section this structure into tiny tiny pieces in fact five typically five micrometers sometimes ten but typically it's five micrometers the thinner it is the easier the light can pass through it which means that it's way easier to visualize it in a light microscope for this purpose we use this tool called the microtome this is a perfect picture of a microtome and this uh, this uh, sorry this uh, tool is used to section this block of paraffin into tiny pieces in many many uh, layers so in this case what we have in our hands is going to be practically a tissue a small a small uh, section of surrounded by paraffin at the center is going to be open of course we're going to have the skin itself uh, cleared and uh, and that's it so again the paraffin in tiny tiny slices and inside is going to be the skin the next step is this if you try to visualize this right now in the microscope you will actually see nothing why because the human body actually a skin or any part of the human body is colorless under a light microscope the only color that we have in the human body is uh, red for again this is this actually from the blood uh, or different other pigments from melanin but again it's not like there's nothing to be visually, visually seen in the microscope so the next step is to exploit a chemical property of the tissue meaning what sometimes we're going to use methods of physical uh, we're going to exploit physical properties in the first, in this case of the classical tissue section we're going to exploit the physical properties of course we know from chemistry that all the human all the uh, molecules are either basic uh, acidic or neutral so the logic is this to practically stay in the tissue using molecules that are acids and bases in this case we're going to use two molecules hematoxylin and eosin hematoxylin is a base and eosin is an acid so all the molecules that are uh, acids will be will have affinity to hematoxylin again careful with the word acidophilic and careful with the word acid acidophilic is a base because acidophilic means affinity to acids and bases themselves have affinity to acids and vice versa of course basophilic structures are practically acidophilic structures that have an affinity to bases so 
eosin is again the acid so uh, as you can see we're gonna see different uh, structures inside the cell that some are basophilic and some are acidophilic the logic is really really simple the moment you see a cell structure that is an acid for example dna deoxyribonucleic acid rna which is again rna is filled practically in the ribosomes there is you can see the rna practically both in ribosomes and in the rough endoplasmic reticulum so the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the ribosomes are going to be basophilic why because they're acids they contain high amount of acids so these two molecules are going to be typical uh, these two structures, let's say interest, intracellular structures, are going to be practically basophilic. And the acidophilic is going to be practically all the bases inside the cell. What we know already from biology is that the cytoplasm is basic, 7.4, I think, 7.8. That's the, pretty much the pH. But again, it's slightly basic. So the color is going to be, again, the color that's going to have is going to be pink. And again, this means this is that it's an acidophilic structure. Typically, we're going to see in the microscope that all the structures that are basophilic are going to be purple. Why? Simply because hematoxin has this purple color. And again, hematoxin is going to practically have an affinity to the structures that are acids. So it's uh, quite easy to understand that any structure that is purple, so hematoxin stain, is a basic, is a, sorry, is an acidic structure. And again, RNA, RNA and uh, smooth plasma reticulum and ribosomes are going to be basophilic structures. And vice versa, eosin is going to be uh, a fin is going to have a certain azotophilic is going to be the cytoplasm. This is one of the chemical characteristics that we can actually exploit to visualize these structures in the microscope. Uh, this, for example, here we use the acid base balance. And there are many others, though. Of course, there are typical other stainings. In fact, there are actually numerous stainings in histology. Some that we should actually mention right now is of the lipids, Sudan 4 and Sudan Black are special staining methods that actually uh, specifically stain lipids we have the pas method the, that stains polysaccharides the argyrophilic the silver impregnation method this stains two different let's say structures of nerve tissue that is actually stained it's argyrophilic which means silver affinity has silver affinity and in reticular fibers reticular tissues we'll discuss them in the connective tissue part and last we have the immunohistochemistry immunohistochemistry is using practically antibodies and antigens in order to actually locate specific enzymes, structures, proteins, whatever molecule it is. The logic is this, uh, that you typically take any molecule that you take, any foreign substance that you take from one organism to the other is going to be perceived as foreign. For example, I want to, let's say, visualize and focus on a protein in the human body, let's say, I don't know, Let's take hemoglobin, okay, for example. Uh, I want to specifically stain an enzyme, okay, specific enzyme. So I'm going to take this human enzyme, I'm going to place it in an animal, maybe a pig, maybe a horse. Then I'm going to practically extract the antibodies produced against this antigen because, again, this enzyme, the human enzyme, we perceived as an antigen to a foreign substance, to a foreign body. So, again, this enzyme is going to be perceived as an antigen and they're going to be antibody, it's going to be antibody production through the immune reaction of the horse or pig or whatever animal we use in this case. Then we isolate the antibodies, we practically use the antibodies to the inside the, inside the slide, and then we can, um, then depending on the different methodology, if it's direct or indirect, we can actually visualize these uh, antibodies or antibody staining, let's say, uh, methods based on, again, on the antibody. That's the logic, of course. There is way more detail into this, but that's not the point of our discussion here. So, as I said before, there are many, many different type of tissues, many, many different type of, uh, of course, staining methods for each different tissues. Again, we'll just discuss some right now, and we can maybe visualize one or two. For example, this is the PAS method. This pink, vividly pink color, this is a PAS positive, a polysaccharidic positive uh, molecule. Here, these are lipids. This is the Sudan 4 or Sudan black, both actually stain the same color. And this is a typical picture of a neuron actually being stained with the argyrophilic staining, or also called nissel staining. So, let's move on. As I said before, we have, this is pretty much the whole process of uh, from forming a, 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 sorry, a section. Again, from the beginning, we could take part of the skin out, we fixate it, to stop the bacteria from and the bacteria and to prevent autolysis 
Then we practically embed it into a paraffin block. Then we cut it in sectioning. There's a section was cut in very thin pieces. Then it's the staining. And after the staining, we have the sliders we have. On the top, of course, to cover up, we use this mount in resin. We mount it in resin. There, you put a block of resin on top of this in order to preserve uh, to preserve the tissue for as long as you want, as long as the uh, histologist or student needs it. But all of this procedure actually exploits the chemical nature, exploits some chemical uh, affinities. In our case, hematoxylin and elzin, also very commonly abbreviated as H and E. In H and E uh, staining, of course, we exploit these acids. But this is just the chemical exploiting. We have many other ways to exploit a tissue. In fact, in this case, we're going to start seeing, for example, how we can exploit light, how we can exploit the, uh, the surface characteristics or the difference in the refractive areas. What does it mean? For example, let's take an example with the face contrast macroscopy. This macroscope actually is uh, the logic and the rationale of this macroscope is that we exploit uh, the refractive index of the objects based on the slide, which means what? We're simply going to take part of the skin out and we're going to place this in the microscope and then we're going to illuminate light on different angles maybe or in different ways. There are two specific subtypes of phase contrast microscopy. There's the interference and the differential interference. Let's take, for example, first up the interference. The interference, practically, as the word suggests, is uh, the logic and the rationale of this microscope is to see how much light can actually pass through the slide. So the more light it passes through the slide means that you have dense, less dense area in it. The more, the less light it passes from the one side to the other means that this object is way, it's way more in dense, like way more dense. So of course, dense structures absorb more light than the uh, loose, uh, the less dense areas, the less dense uh, structures. So this is the logic. Using this, let's say this propor this pro property of light to practically be absorbed from dense structures and not be absorbed by less dense structures, we can actually quantify how much of this tissue is present in this microscope. This is the first logic of phase contrast microscopy. There is a second one. The second is the differential interference. What does this mean? It means, simply means that we take the slide and we illuminate light from many different angles on this slide and based on the shadows, based on the practically the absorbance of light again, and based on the shadow that is being seen on the other side, we can uh, assess the surface of this structure. So in phase contrast microscopy, we use light in two different ways. Practically, one is from the, to that how much light passes through the slide, and the other one is what is the shadowing of the uh, slide based on different angles. This is, for example, some pictures of this phase contrast microscopy. Confocal microscopy, here we actually, this is another example, and here in this case, we simply use lasers and modern technology to produce a 3D picture. Again, this is just uh, another method to visualize structures as it is. The picture is actually very, very impressive. Next, we have the polarizing microscopy. Again, the logic is this. Polar actually means, uh, means that there are two sides. There are specific sides. Not only two, but there are specific sides. There are specific direction from one to the other. The logic is this. Actually, the logic is the same as optic fibers in, in physics. If we have an optic fibers, a tube that practically is that uh, practically reflects light, and the same logic is of the objects that we use in polarized microscopy. Some molecules, either in nature, naturally or non naturally, can actually reflect light within a specific structure. Typically, these structures are tubular. So, for example, collagen fibers are tubular structures that are elongated. Let's take an example: collagen, and the logic is exactly the same as that of optic fibers, which means that. As the light passes through this tube, the light is being reflected throughout the whole diameter and the periphery of the, of the, let's say, the tubular structure, and light passes from one side towards the other. So the, exactly the same logic is, of, the, exactly that uh, characteristic is that we exploit in polarizing microscopy. Collagen fibers, again, are polarized, which means that they have a specific direction from one to the other. And once the light is properly illuminated in the direction of the fiber, then the light passes through and allows the light to be reflected throughout the whole tubule and then we can visualize it macroscopically in, for example, in the polarizing microscopy, sorry. Next up, we have the fluorescence microscopy. This is, uh, this is the practically 
the macroscopy that we uh, that exploits the fluorescence of some structures. We have naturally fluorescent structures and induced uh, fluorescent structures. In, for example, we have uh, in naturally uh, naturally uh, sorry natural fluorescent molecules is going to be vitamin A, vitamin B2, and porphyrins. These are some molecules that porphyrins is actually a substance that you will see that is very very important in erythrocytes further on. The point is this that uh, the logic of fluorescence is practically the proportion, the, the sorry, the property of a tissue to absorb light, or property of any molecule actually, to absorb light and then emit it in a different wavelength. Of course, this different wavelength can actually be perceived through fluorescence microscopy. If you remember, a perfect example for, for anyone to understand is that if you remember these small stars, these dinosaur stars that used to, that actually used to absorb light and then illuminate this greenish yellowish light during the night, this is exactly the same logic. So, of course, first you illuminate light to this structure that is naturally fluorescent. It will absorb it and eventually will practically emit it again in a different wavelength. So, and this is what we actually visualize in the microscope. This uh, logic is used in watches as well, in many, many things that we, used to, uh, you, we use in the night. Uh, but this is, of course, in the case of naturally uh, fluorescent molecules. Of course, we have some molecules that will be uh, that we're going to add dyes that will make them fluorescent. For example, this, the DNA itself is not fluorescent, but if we add acridin, this, this molecule of acridin, this will make a, form a complex, uh, this complex molecule, this complex structure that is fluorescent. So we can actually visualize DNA practically adding acridin and will emit a yellow, yellowish light. And the same with RNA. So, in this case, we have used, we exploited the uh, potential of fluorescence. Lastly, we have the electromicroscopy. Practically, the logic of the electromicroscopy is very, very similar to light microscopy. The logic of light microscopy is that practically light passes through this molecule and you can visualize what is in the end. Electrons, and of course, light microscopy uses, of course, photons, which has this dual nature, this dual nature of waves and the dual nature of, uh, of bodies, of, sphere, of spherical bodies. So, in this case, the idea was this, that uh, we can use practically electrons to pass from one side to the other. Again, the logic is the same, because in both cases we have small bodies passing from one structure to the other, through the structures, from one side to the other side. That's the same. But the advantage of this is that because electrons are so much smaller, we can have a much, much higher resolution. We talk about resolution very, very often in our society, uh, but we don't actually, I don't know, maybe we actually understand what it means, resolution. Resolution, by definition, is the minimal distance when we can actually see two different parts, two different items apart. For example, when we see a YouTube video that is in 360 pixels, you can actually see the squares, squares, squares. So the minimal distance that we can, you can tell the two squares apart is high is low, sorry. So we can see then the, there's actually uh, a big distance between the two different cubes, two different pixels, as we call them. The higher the resolution is, the smaller these cubes, the, the smaller these squares become, so the less is the minimal distance. So the resolution practically here in this structure is that as a result of the, electron, of the use of electron microscopy is 0.1 nanometers. We care about this number for one reason, because uh, we can actually see, uh, in, order to, in order to assess whether one structure is visualized through light microscopy or uh, electron microscopy, we have to actually understand the difference in the size, the difference in the size. For example, the resolution in the light microscopy, we'll discuss it in a bit, the light microscopy resolution is 0.1 micrometers, and the resolution of the electron microscopy is 0.1 nanometers. So if I want to visualize a structure, okay, that is, uh, let's say the cell membrane, which is seven micrometers. I will not be able to use this in the, I will not be able to visualize this structure in the light microscopy, but I will be able to visualize this in electron microscopy. So the number matters. So 0 0.1 nanometer is the resolution for the electron microscopy. We can magnify the one structure that we can see up to 400,000 times. This is, ins the number is insane. So, even though this, this, uh, this uh, equipment is expensive sometimes to get, it actually provides details that we cannot log, we cannot see, not visualize and analyze through uh, the light microscopy. So, 
this is, for example, the result of one scanning electron microscopy uh, image right here. As I was saying about light microscopy, uh, the structure that actually allows us to see 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 micrometers. Uh, this actually allows them, allows us to magnify uh, the structure up to one, typically 1,000 times. Sometimes there are some microscopes that have 1,500 1, times, but most light microscope microscopes reach up to 1,000 times. So again, it's really important to understand the sizes. And uh, in this example that I use for the uh, cell membrane, the seven nanometers, the seven nanometers of the cell membrane are not going is a structure that's going to not going to be visualized through light microscopy, but only through electron microscopy. So actually, it does matter. Uh, Bef whenever we see a structure, let's talk about some practical tips in the microscope because uh, even though this is the theory is very, very nice, uh, the picture that you see in textbooks is not going to be necessarily the one you're going to see in the microscope as well. Because in real life microscopy, in real life histology, uh, you will see this phenomenon of overlap many, many, many times. What does this mean? What does it mean overlap? Never forget that whenever we see a structure in the microscope, we're practically visualizing a three-dimensional figure, a three-dimensional structure. So if you take a picture, that if you cut through this three-dimensional uh, structure in many different directions, because it is going to be in many different directions, you're not going to be able to find all the specific cells in all the same exact length. So it's going to be, of course, in different, in different locations. Let's take an example like this. If I have my, cut my fist like this, Practically, and I cut uh, and I section this uh, fist in this manner. I will see a thumb being pressed and thumb, a thumb being placed in the middle of the palm. This does, and I will visualize in the microscope that I see a part of the thumb inside the palm. Of course, this does not mean that the structure of the thumb can be found inside the palm, but it simply does an overlap of this structure on the other. So this phenomenon is going to be actually is going to make our life a bit more tricky, a bit more difficult. And we have to really understand first very, very well how the structure is in a th in practically inside the, inside the structure as it is, and then using the microscope to practically and very, very cleverly figure out what is what. For example, in this picture, we see an orange, and the, the parallel line is, of course, that of the, um, of the nephron. Here, this is the glomerulus of the, of the kidney. So if you take a section in the middle and you're going to see this picture, again, this is the orange. Again, if you take a section of, on the top, you're going to find, again, just a tiny structure. But again, this tiny structure is the orange. This is the same structure. This does not mean that glomerulus is different. It means that all of these pictures actually are different angles and different sections of the same structure. So it's quite easy to be fooled sometimes. But we're going to go through some tricks and some practically explanations of how you can actually identify the overlap and identify which structure is actually there and which is practically an overlap or just an artifact. The same logic is that of the, here we have a small intestine for example, and we can see that sectioning by sectioning the small intestine in many different directions, in many different angles, we can have different visual results. If someone sees for example this picture, uh, you, the scientist can actually say that, well, this, we can see that the intestine has two tubes. Well, this is not actually the case. We just simply see one section that involves the tube, the coil of the small intestine. So you can actually visualize this. The point is that sometimes visualizing things in microscope can be very, very tricky. So please be aware of this phenomenon of overlapping and keep your eyes open. Uh, and to finish up, one last practical tip for uh, histology, generally speaking. Uh, we're not going to go through cytology detailedly, of course. This is a topic that should be covered in biology. Uh, but we're going to go through the, the details practically and the, uh, let's say, the results of using H&E, hematoxid uh, and staining method, practically uh, exploiting some cytology features. As I said in the beginning, as I said during staining, I said that the RER and the ribosomes are basophilic. What does this mean practically? means that these two structures, the function of these two structures is common. They both produce enzymes. They both produce, I mean, uh, sorry, polyphytic chains. They both, pro they both produce peptides. So these features, these two, let's say, comp co components of the cell 
RER and the ribosomes are that of a productive cell. So, and we already know that these two features, these two components are basophilic. So as a consequence, if I see a cell that is of high purple color, practically this is again highly basophilic. So there's a high amount of RER and high amount of uh, ribosomes inside the cytoplasm. This automatically gives me the information that this cell is highly productive. This cell produces in a high amount pro pro uh, proteinic structures. Either that is going to be just one peptide or polypeptides or enzymes or antibodies or whatever molecule that actually is made out of, pepti of, uh, of amino acids. So again, basophilic structures indicate a highly active cell. Uh, of course, we have other, other structures that are uh, sometimes visible in the microscope, of course. Nucleus as well is visible in the microscope, of course, and again, it's basophilic because it contains DNA. So we can clearly see uh, the proportion of cytoplasm, proportions of cytoplasm to nucleus very, very easily, visualized, visualized quite easily. And of course, this gives us again, this gives us again information. For example, we can actually see the polarity of the cell, meaning that what? Meaning that typically highly productive cells, of course, meaning that that have an extensive RER and extensive ribosomes, will have the typically will have the nucleus in the base part. May for example, take the pus in the pancreatic acinar cell, cells of the pancreas that are again highly productive. You're gonna find the in the towards the base again. This is the base. This is the apex, and this is the lateral sides of the cell. Towards the base, typically it's going to be the nucleus. Of course, this is again in highly productive cells, as for example, plasma cells as well. The base is going to have the nucleus as itself, this clock, uh, this clock appearance of the nucleus. And this is going to be an extens extensive network of RER and ribosomes that actually will be visible in the microscope. So uh, this is actually something that we should keep in mind. We're going to see this feature very, very commonly and, and very, very often throughout the whole next slides. Thank you, guys.